Okay, wonderful. Um, all right, so I can I can get started with just the, the house rules and then hand it over for the organization introduction. So thank you everybody for joining our care extractivism panel. Um, I'm just gonna say a brief uh, couple of house rules and things to note for the um, for the webinar and feel free to ask questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so a couple of things to know, uh, as you've heard on the audio, this uh, will be recorded. Um, this will be recorded. Um, and also we're going to have the chat open for participants to interact with each other um, as well as the panelists. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function and GHJP and uh, PHM will be fielding those questions to the moderator. At the end, we'll have an open discussion and you'll be able to raise your hand if you prefer to ask your question out loud. And if you're encountering any Zoom issues, um, feel free to message myself or Deepika and we can try to figure those out for you. Uh, so now um, I'll hand it off to uh, Deepika to introduce the People's Health Movement. Thanks, Brianna. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Deepika from PHM and uh, along with Brianna, I'm hosting uh, this uh, Zoom event today. Um, one of us will paste the Zoom agenda on the chat and uh, we're hoping to be on time. I will take another two minutes to introduce PHM and then I'll hand it over to Ali. Um, People's Health Movement is a global network bringing together grassroots activists, civil society organizations, and academic institutions from around the world, particularly from low and middle income countries. We currently have a presence in around 70 countries. We are guided by the People's Charter for Health, which I, am, I will be pasting here in chat. Uh, PHM works on various programs and activities and is committed to comprehensive primary health care and addressing the social, environmental, and economic determinants of health. And uh, yeah, over to you, uh, Ali. Thank you, Deepika. And thank you, uh, Bree, for helping us get started. And many, many thanks to the People's Health Movement uh, for working with the Global Health Justice Partnership to have this panel. Um, I'm Ali Miller, and uh, along with Greg Gonzalez and Amy Kepchinski, we um, began the Global uh, Health Justice Partnership at Yale in 2012 to leverage the resources of a university to support activism and social movements uh, in, the, in the world in order to achieve health justice. Um, we are an initiative of the law school and the public health school, and we train students together to undertake collaborative real world research and advocacy to promote health justice in the US and globally. We also work to organize events and conferences, working with collaborating partners around the world. And we seek to build partnerships with social movements in New Haven, the US and globally to turn critical analysis into action. And we hope that we are nurturing an interdisciplinary uh, and publicly available brain trust dedicated to affecting social change. This panel is a project of uh, a particular a uh, component of the Global Health Justice Partnership's work under the direction of Dr. Uni Karunakara, who's here on uh, our, our web webinar today. And with the support of the Soros Foundation, we have carried out a project for the last year uh, working with collaborating writers and researchers around the world on the human and social costs of the COVID pandemic. We're look COVID pandemic responses. So we're looking to see the ways in which which justice is increased or decreased, not just by the pandemic, but by the actions that states and other actors take in response to that pandemic. And this panel is one activity of that project. On our website, you can see other projects and writing commentaries from authors around the world, primarily from the global south, exploring topics ranging from the principles guiding equitable global COVID-19 testing frameworks. Uh, we have an interrogation of the global order in regard to politically isolated countries and a reinvocation of a more meaningful understanding of global solidarity. 
as well as a commentary on a grounded rethinking of a stance of decolonization in the African continent in the context of the pandemic. Today's panel on care extractivism was inspired by a commentary by the People's Health Movement, uh, the Equitable Health Systems Thematic Circle. And today, this panel is chaired by my colleague here at Yale, Professor Jennifer Klein. Professor Klein is the Bradford Durfee Professor of History in the field of 20th century US history. Her research spans the fields of US labor history, urban history, social movements, and political economy. Her publications, which have won many prizes, include Caring for America, Home Health Workers in the Shadow of the Welfare State, co-authored with Eileen Boris, and For All These Rights, Business, Labor, and the Shaping of America's Public Health, Private, uh, Public Private Welfare State. She is also a senior editor for the journal International Labor and Working Class History. And most importantly, Professor Klein links her scholarship to support labor in real world action. She's an ac academic seeking to support activism and hence her role in moderating today's panel. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. And I'm really excited to have been invited uh, to participate in this group discussion and in this, you know, really wider um, engaged project. Uh, the topic that um, we're addressing today about uh, care and the global political economy brings together our most compelling and urgent social questions, those of an aging society, of global migration, labor standards, uh, as capitalism transforms and the state transforms, social support, disability rights. And so um, uh, it's very encouraging to see the different ways in which we can address these um, and build new alliances that will be effective in generating power and security for workers. We are going to begin with um, Professor Lauren Paramore, uh, and she is going to present first the commentary uh, that um, Ali Miller referred to. So she is a member of the People's Health Movement, South Africa, and a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town. Her research focuses on health activism, global governance for health and political mobilization aimed at realizing social citizenship in societies of the global South. She explores these themes in relation to the struggle for the right to HIV AIDS treatment in South Africa, social reproduction work undertaken by women and the use of for-profit markets and philanthropic capitalism to ameliorate the worst effects of deteriorating public health systems. After her presentation, we will have commentary by three, um, uh, three panelists. And again, I think what is so significant and wonderful about this panel is that it's bringing together um, scholars and uh, practitioners, people who are in the field, in labor unions, and in different kinds of community organizing movements and foundations. So first we will hear from Pedro Zayas, New England Healthcare Employees uh, Union, it's 1199 SEIU, um, New England. He is the communications director for New England Healthcare Employees Union, where he supports union members in their public relations, policy and strategic efforts. Pedro has 20 years of journalism experience working for major news organizations like ESPN and the Associated Press with extensive experience in delivering breaking news and developing enterprise feature stories. Pedro has um, maintained focus on content creation for multimedia platforms, strategic planning and bilingual uh, uh, bilingual messages in uh, Spanish language. We will hear from AR Sindhu, Center of Indian Trade Unions, uh, that's CITU. Uh, 
Sindhu is National Secretary for the Center of Indian Trade Unions and the General Secretary for the All India Federation of Angawadi Workers and Helpers. She holds the position of convener for the All India Coordination Committee of Working Women, the Women's Committee of CITU, and oversees the All India Working Committee of ASHA Workers and Midday Meal Workers Federation of India. For the last 25 years, Sindhu has worked in the trade union movement, particularly among unorganized sector workers in Northern India. And I think this also highlights the ways in which um, uh, gender will be so crucial in the discussion that we will be having today. Uh, and then Christina Colclough from the Why Not Lab will be our final commentator today. She is the founder of the Why Not Lab, a boutique value-driven consultancy that puts workers at the center of digital change. In this capacity, Christina works with unions, interest organizations, and governments across the world on issues of AI governance, workers' data rights and human rights, and the development of responsible digital technology. In addition, Christina co-developed WeClock, an open source privacy preserving app to empower workers and unions through the responsible collection and analysis of work-related data. Christina is included in the all-time Hall of Fame of the world's most brilliant women in, um, in AI ethics and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Following our panelists' commentaries, we will have um, uh, a brief uh, question um, uh, discussion among the panelists to follow up, and then we will open it up uh, for the rest of the audience. Lauren, please uh, initiate our conversation. Thanks, Jennifer, and uh, good day to uh, everyone here. Thank you to Yale and People's Health Movement for setting up the, um, the webinar. I am going to ask the host um, to broadcast the yes. PowerPoint presentation. Okay, and then while it's playing, I'm going to switch off my camera. Um, but, you know, while that's loading, I, I think it's worth noting that um, the official death toll of COVID, of course, is reported to be around 5 million globally. Um, the Economist projects that the excess deaths due to COVID um, since the start of the pandemic is at about 17 million people. Um, and, and since we're speaking about uh, care work, social reproduction work and care extractivism in particular, uh, I think it's worth thinking about that, um, you know, if we calculate that 10 people were involved, whether doing paid or unpaid care work for those 17 million people that have passed away over the past two years, that's 170 million people um, that have not only been impacted by loss, um, but that have provided care and, and labor time. Um, and that includes physical and emotional labor. Um, and, and so I think that's huge. And I say that um, sitting in South Africa, where of course um, we've just been subjected to travel bans uh, due to the um, emergence of a new variant. And there are all sorts of questions around that um, and the, um, the additional deaths um, that's likely to be caused by the new COVID variant that's been observed. So, so that's the context we're in. Um, I don't see the slideshow loading. Um, I'm going to give it a few more seconds, but just to say that the paper I'm presenting, I'm presenting on behalf of the PHM Health System Circle. Raina, uh, can you try sharing, please? Uh, it um, was written collectively by myself and seven other co-authors. You'll see their names um, in the slideshow. We wrote it during the first half of this year, and it was published in July 2021. Um, the paper focuses on uh, gay extractivism. Perhaps I should try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, is that visible? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So let me go with that. 
Um, okay. So as I mentioned, uh, the, um, the paper is a product of the PHM Health Systems Thematic Circle. It was written collectively by the authors you see listed um, on the left. It's a team of eight people um, from PHM circles in uh, Europe, uh, Southern and Central Europe, uh, the UK, India, South Africa. Um, and the, uh, the paper focuses on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, on, on health workers and particularly health workers at the, uh, the lower levels of the occupational hierarchy. So it uses a political economy analysis to look at how nurses, community health workers and auxiliary workers were affected by the pandemic. Um, and uh, some of the authors of the paper are here today. And so I'm hoping that um, during the Q&A, perhaps we can involve them in um, answering some of the questions as well. Um, the paper kind of takes its starting point um, in one of the key contradictions of the pandemic, which is that health workers have been applauded as heroes. Um, and yet what we have seen since, uh, let's say roughly January 2020, is that despite being framed as heroes, health workers um, have been uh, exploited, their rights have been undermined uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, and so this contradiction has been especially stark in the global south, but also at lower levels of the occupational hierarchy within the health sector. Um, in this paper, we try and look at why uh, this contradiction has persisted for the last two years, but also before that, uh, and to provide some policy recommendations um, to address uh, some of the worst effects on health workers. Um, our point of departure is really that uh, COVID-19, and this is often said, uh, that the pandemic hasn't necessarily brought about new dynamics. Instead, it's kind of um, helped to expose quite starkly, in fact, um, the unequal distribution of risk and vulnerability um, that people generally faced in the context of a neoliberal globalized economy, um, but also that health workers faced um, the divides between health workers working in public and private sectors in the global south versus in the global north, and then uh, elite health workers, let's say surgeons versus health workers at the lower end of the occupational hierarchy. So let's say porters, cleaners, cooks, and so forth. Um, uh, in general, the pre-COVID context was characterized by the emergence of various forms of, of precarious work, uh, disinvestment in public services generally, including in healthcare, and of course, along with that, um, we've seen at least since the 1980s an increase in commercialization of healthcare services. And uh, this has gone um, along with increasing health worker migration, um, where health workers from the global south um, have moved to the north in, in seek of economic opportunities. And, and partly, this has been driven by disinvestment in, uh, in the public health systems of the global south. Um, what we see is, even though there has been a celebration of primary health care um, since 2008, more or less, with um, the WHO's universal health coverage agenda, this agenda really has focused uh, perhaps mostly on health care financing and positioning governments as purchasers rather than providers of, of health care services. Um, and then, of course, we know uh, that historically, uh, social reproduction work, care work, um, whether it's paid for or not paid for is deeply gendered. Um, and so this gendered division of labor is reflected uh, pre-COVID, but also during COVID in women taking on the majority of our care work, uh, care work in, in the household, um, but also in, in the labor market for health care workers. Um, in addition, one of the pre-COVID uh, dynamics um, that is characterized societies of both the North and the South. Um, it's most frequently written about, I think, in the context of the global South, um, is the shift to kind of volunteerism or, or workers like CHWs, community health workers or ushers. Um, in some cases that um, 
that occupy a kind of gray zone between uh, volunteers and paid workers and contract workers. Um, so the, the, the main point really of, of the slide is that our point of departure is that there was a, a systemic crisis, a crisis of social reproduction long before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that this has driven insecurity in uh, social reproduction work, including paid work uh, in the healthcare sector, uh, and that COVID-19 has intensified um, the forms of exploitation uh, that people are subjected to in the course of doing um, healthcare work and then social, uh, social reproduction work more broadly. In terms of the theoretical framework that we've used, we look at health as more, just, uh, more than just the absence of disease, so as a, a total state of our being. And so the assumption there is that um, health really isn't only determined by access to medical care, but by broader social determinants. So the, the conditions in which people uh, are born, educated, live, uh, work, and so forth. Um, we also thought that it was essential to look at um, healthcare work in the context of the, uh, the broader global political economy. Um, and, and so this has meant looking not only at um, how healthcare work functions uh, at the national level, but really how national uh, labor markets um, conditions of employment, um, salaries, levels of organization, unionization in some cases, um, but not always. Um, so how these factors at the national level are conditioned by a particular state's position within the global economic hierarchy and the kinds of pressures um, that states have been subjected to. Um, as a result of increasing austerity structural adjustment and so forth since at least the 1980s. Um, and then uh, we also have looked at uh, forms of care extractivism. So in other words, um, how the, um, the social reproduction work that people, uh, quite often women do, um, has been used as a unpaid subsidy uh, in the context of declining spending on social services and healthcare by the state, um, that this unpaid work um, is used uh, to subsidize forms of care that the state no longer can or wishes to pay for, um, while at the same time um, in enabling through policy uh, that is the state enabling through policy um, an increased commercialization of whatever healthcare services are on offer. Um, and so we wanted to look really at the intersection between this broader global political economy framework, its impact at the national level, particularly on um, institutions and social relations that shape uh, labor markets and health, um, but also the conditions um, in those labor markets that then impact on the health and well-being of healthcare workers. So um, I'm going to leave it at that uh, and move on to our findings. Um, so the findings I've arranged uh, in, to focus on sources of vulnerability that have impacted healthcare workers. Uh, and so perhaps, um, the first thing to say is that really social determinants uh, of health are really, really vital and often have a profound effect on health workers' health. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Um, in our research, which drew on published literature, um, case studies provided by PHM country circles, um, at the published literature was academic, but also activist literature policies and so on. Um, and also participant observation by the contributors to the, the case study. Um, we found that uh, health worker health outcomes, so let's just say health outcomes, and assume I'm seeking about health workers, that health outcomes are often worse uh, for workers at lower levels of the occupational hierarchy. And this didn't only have to do with imbalances uh, in power between uh, workers, let's say um, community health workers or um, security guards at, at public health facilities uh, and more senior uh, health staff. But it also had to, had to do with the fact that these um, occupational hierarchies intersect with social hierarchies. 
So workers at the, um, the lower end of the occupational scale were often doubly marginalized and were more likely to come from uh, discriminated against or stigmatized social groups. Uh, and so this um, really impacted uh, their ability to negotiate um, and secure the resources they needed to be safe, to protect their, their own health during COVID-19. So this included, for example, in South Africa, cases of community health workers not having access to PPE uh, while um, workers that were more firmly embedded in the formal health system did have access to these resources. Um, reports uh, that sometimes workers at the lower end of the occupational hierarchy uh, felt coerced um, to get vaccinated. So some reports uh, initially during the early days of vaccinations uh, from ashes in India, for example, um, but also that these, because these workers um, had limited occupational status and limited social status, um, they were uh, also locked into a power structure where um, they had lower levels of unionization um, because their access to jobs was so tenuous. And so um, this compounded their, um, their precarity and their ability to negotiate and defend their health in the context of the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the other factor that um, was really, really important um, was the, the continued prevalence of, of patriarchal norms, um, particularly norms around uh, social reproduction work being um, women's work, uh, you know, so we see, of course, that um, healthcare workers at the lower end of the occupational hierarchy tend mostly to be women, so nurses and community health workers. Uh, these women faced increased workloads uh, during the pandemic. Um, and this is, when I say increased workloads, I'm speaking specifically about their uh, healthcare work, uh, so the scope of work that they have assigned to them as nurses and as uh, community health workers. Um, but what we see during the pandemic is that the, the double load of work they do. So in addition to that work, they have uh, care work within the household, um, looking after elderly people or children, for example, um, that this tends still to be women's work. Um, that this work didn't go away, and in fact, it intensified during COVID-19 uh, as a result of lockdowns, for example, schools and creches were closed, um, where childcare facilities were not closed. Um, women had to uh, spend money to purchase childcare services uh, because of austerity, but often uh, there are examples um, from cases in Europe uh, when nurses spent considerable amounts of money to access childcare uh, during hours where they still had to report for work. Um, and that this uh, gobbles up a large amount of, of their, their salary. Um, and of course, you know, this kind of service is expensive to purchase because of uh, government disinvestment uh, in things like free childcare facilities, or as in the case of, of the US, this is not really um, having been established uh, ever. Um, so the, the other stressors for female uh, health workers during lockdowns included uh, difficulties accessing transport, um, but also that um, they often had irregular wages. So for example, in the case of community health workers, um, there were reports that uh, their wages were stopped, um, even though they continued the healthcare work they did. So it was stopped, stopped, for example, in South Africa due to um, funding cuts. Um, but also uh, some healthcare workers reported irregular payments of their salaries because their working hours uh, were restricted sometimes, for example, when they had to self-isolate after getting uh, exposed to COVID-19. Um, two other sources of vulnerability include nationality, so specifically um, migrant health workers um, being unable to, to return home uh, during COVID-19 when their contracts were ended. So for example, South Asian uh, nurses working in the Middle East, um, but also difficulties with immigration services, extending visas and so on. Um, 
that these were forms of precarity, for example, that uh, nurses from Central and Eastern Europe experienced in the context of the UK. Um, health workers also experienced um, problems stemming from their sites of work. So here in particular, um, we're thinking about community health workers um, who tend to work in the context of private households and in communities. Um, some CHWs reported being seen uh, as um, uh, uh, risking the, the community's lives because the, the assumption was that they could expose the community to COVID-19, that they were, they were working with people that were not well and so uh, were likely to uh, be exposed to the virus and perhaps to bring it to the community. Um, but, uh, but also um, the fact that because community health workers in particular um, and other home-based carers work in private settings, um, whatever vulnerabilities they did experience, they struggled to respond to collectively um, because of course there's no central place of work uh, from which to organize. Uh, and then finally, um, and I think unsurprisingly, non-standard forms of employment um, contributed to the invisibility of health workers uh, and deepened forms of marginalization that had existed before COVID-19. Um, it also compromised health workers' ability to access special benefits. So workers that were more precariously employed generally struggled to get access to special grants, subsidies, tax breaks offered for health workers um, under COVID-19 and also struggled to get access to psychosocial support to deal with the trauma of, of um, working in a context where they experienced uh, mass suffering, uh, high numbers of, of deaths, and also the loss of colleagues quite often. Um, at the same time, uh, our case study did show that uh, there were examples, uh, for example, in Europe, of um, solidarity amongst health workers uh, across the occupational hierarchy uh, and where the, with this did occur, it often led to uh, less risk, marginally less risk for health workers at, at lower levels of the occupational hierarchy. So for example, insisting that um, uh, staff, uh, auxiliary staff and community health workers also be eligible to access vaccinations, for example. Uh, insistence by nurses um, that that this be this service be extended to uh, workers at on um, non-standard contracts, um, and then of course at the at the structural level, um, one of the biggest sources of risk uh, of exposure to ill health and death is uh, vaccine apartheid, um, and so we know that um, due to patent monopolies. Um, that have created uh, artificially low supplies of COVID-19 vaccines, but also limited access to diagnostics that are needed to track the epidemic and PPE that are needed, uh, that's needed to prevent exposure to COVID-19 infection. Um, health workers have, um, have been at risk of contracting COVID-19 and have passed away. And this is particularly the case in the global south. So based on this analysis, we uh, generated a number of policy recommendations. Um, I think at, at the kind of uh, biggest structural level, um, one of the key recommendations is that governments insist on um, recognizing the value of essential public services, um, both during COVID-19, but, but even before COVID-19. And, and really that public provision of healthcare services and other social services uh, should be a priority, should be subsidized, and should be based on need um, rather than financial calculations. Um, the Lauren, uh, uh, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but uh, if you can wrap up in next uh, couple of minutes. Okay, no problem. Um, the uh, the other big recommendation here was that government should prevent the, should prevent or act on the drivers of inequality that place workers in a position where they're forced to take on precarious forms of work. Um, I've already emphasized that there's, an, uh, there's a recommendation to invest in public health investments. This is not only a uh, recommendation that functions at the national level, but it also requires um, 
engaging with uh, international financial institutions that often are the drivers of austerity measures in low and middle income countries. Um, and these kinds of austerity measures lead to outcomes like disinvestment in health or freezing of public sector posts and forms of non-standard employment emerging. Uh, the third recommendation is to protect uh, workers' wages uh, to improve their working conditions uh, and to um, end non-standard forms of employment. Uh, here in particular, also there's a need to look at um, managing the adverse effects of health worker migration where health workers trained in the South uh, choose to take up work in the North and then leave um, health systems, particularly public health systems in the South uh, without sufficient health care, human resources for health. Um, and of course, and fifth, uh, the recommendations we came up with were to um, prioritizing training for health workers, um, recognizing community health workers as public sector employees and securing a clear career trajectory for these workers. Um, but also that um, workers really should have a seat at the decision-making table, that this should be a key priority uh, at national and at global level. And this means um, giving workers the space and support to organize and including health worker organizations in key decision-making processes. So um, thank you. And I'm sorry for going a little bit over time. Thanks. Okay, quickly, thank, thank you, Lauren. Um, Jashodara Dasgupta, um, had, who is one of the co-authors of the report, just wanted um, to offer, I think, a one-minute comment, if that's possible. I can't actually see the person, so um, Deepika, did you have that comment? Jashodra, I'll just, uh, since you're, ha yeah, I'll just do that for you, just a second. I'll unmute you. We can only take one minute for that and then we'll move on. Yes, Jashoda, just, just you can speak now. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, no, I think I just wanted to emphasize what Lawrence said about the fact that we need to look at some of the structural determinants as to why um, gender and other forms of inequality are shaping uh, the vulnerabilities of the health workers. And that's because the workforce are concentrated in the And I think we really need to keep this in mind um, as we look at our recommendations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I think, um, first of all, some of our other commentators uh, will um, uh, bring that out. And um, I certainly have a question um, about that for our moderated discussion. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for center, you know, placing that in the center for us. And I think we'll be able to unpack that further in our conversation. Now we will have Pedro Zayas um, from SEIU 1199 in New England uh, as a commentator. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see my uh, Hartford Current screen there? Okay, good. Hi, everybody. My name is Pedro Zayas. I'm Director of Communications for the New England Healthcare Employees Union, SEIU 1199. We represent around 26,000 healthcare workers in the state of Connecticut and some 4,000 in Rhode Island. Um, about uh, 15,000 or more of them uh, work in uh, long-term care. Uh, that would be uh, home care, nursing homes, or community programs, which consist of group homes and day programs. Uh, at our union, uh, 24 of our members have died due to COVID complications, uh, highly likely uh, most of them got COVID on the job, and uh, some of their family members have also passed away. 
Uh, some others got sick uh, with temporary damage and some are still carrying permanent damage. Uh, so it's been an occupational hazard that has had a huge impact in the industry that we represent, of course. Um, our workforce is majority women. It's, uh, it's majority Black and Latino women uh, or recent immigrants, including Russians, Ukrainians, Polish, and, 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 and the rest is the majority white working women uh, with a small um, segment of male uh, workers. And usually they're also immigrants, Jamaicans, Africans, Haitians. Um, so uh, we can see some trends and this certainly aligns with the findings uh, of the report that we're discussing here today. Um, the union before COVID began, the union was uh, working along the lines as uh, that, you know, the, the, the long-term care sector has relied uh, forever in, on poverty wages, right? And on the backs of working women. And, and we uh, at the union were sending out a message before COVID that uh, this is a matter of uh, urgent, uh, racial, gender, and economic justice, making sure that these are good jobs and that the people doing these jobs are getting cared for themselves and can take care of their families should be a priority in a wealthy state like Connecticut. And lo and behold, when COVID hit, these were the workers who were most exposed to COVID and the people they cared for also were heavily exposed to COVID. We've registered thousands of deaths along nursing home residents in the wealthy state of Connecticut. And a lot of that had to do with short staffing practices, lack of PPE, and lack of accountability by the state. So the message of the union is for that to not happen again, we need to make sure again that these are good jobs and that we have uh, plans in place so that when another public health emergency hits our shores, we are ready. Right, we are ready to respond. We have the staff, and people like Francine Bailey, uh, who is a nursing home worker, and it's the person you see here on the screen, uh, don't have to uh, lose their mother, right? Because she got COVID on the job, she went home, Ma her mother got COVID on the job, and her mother passed away sadly. And Francine is still recovering physically and mentally from that loss. Uh, and this is a nursing home long-term care worker. Uh, here you have Jennifer Brown. Jennifer Brown is a group home worker for Sunrise. Uh, and by the way, all the workers, I'm featuring three workers today of the three different long-term care sectors we, uh, we represent. Uh, Jennifer is a group home worker. She's currently on strike. And all these workers have multiple jobs. Uh, uh, Jennifer Brown works for Sunrise. It's a nonprofit group home agency. Uh, Jennifer Brown, uh, if she were to take her health insurance for family health insurance, her premiums are $6,000 a month. So here you have another issue of healthcare workers and primary caregivers providing close contact care, and they don't have health insurance, right? Caregivers who don't have health care. We see that a lot in the women who are doing the work in the front lines of long-term care in the state of Connecticut. So uh, Jennifer is fighting for a pension and for affordable health care. The third worker I wanna feature is in our home care uh, sector, Lucia Nunez. Uh, Lucia provides services for people at home. She also has three jobs. Uh, in Lucia's case, she doesn't even have a $6,000 option for health care. She has no health care option, no pension option, she makes $16.25 an hour. If her client goes to the hospital today, she's got no paycheck because she can't go and serve that client. If she gets sick, Lucia, she needs to decide, does she not get paid that week or does she go to work sick and perhaps not be able to take care of herself properly or infect the person who she's caring for? So as you see, all these anecdotal and all these stories align very well with the findings uh, that we have on the table today as to how, the, how these jobs have been sort of, you know, given away, sort of, you know, put at the end of the line. Uh, it's sort of taken for granted that women are going to do it or recent immigrants are going to do it. Uh, and thus we have 
sustain the system here that is really unsustainable anymore, right? After COVID, we know that short staffing kills people, right? Uh, not being prepared with proper PPE, with proper training, with proper communication uh, between the state, the, the, the operators and the workers, uh, all of that puts everyone in danger. But not only the people there, but these workers are part of our communities. So uh, they need to have the resources to protect themselves and their families so that uh, they can also uh, make sure that uh, whatever is happening at our nursing home, if there's an infection, doesn't come out uh, to the community and affect us all. Now, the good news is uh, that the union has proven to be a very strong collateral to fix these problems, right? Um, uh, SEIU 119 New England has been able to add over $400 million to the Connecticut state budget for nursing homes and group homes and day programs for the next two years. Connecticut has a biennial budget. So we called out a strike against the state to ask the state, demand that the state properly fund these services. And the state, Governor Lamont and the Connecticut legislature did come through with the additional funding. Now we are, we are uh, taking that to the employers so that we can get that funding in a contract for the workers. Uh, and we're still working on the home care front, but the good news is that the federal government has allocated over $240 million to improve home, health, home care services in the state of Connecticut. Uh, so we are negotiating that and we're trying to make sure that these home care workers also have a livable wage, affordable health care, and a retirement to look forward to in their, in their old age. Um, thank you all uh, for uh, hearing us out and I will stand by for your questions. Uh, uh, thank you. Okay, we will now, thank you. We will now hear from Sindhu. Uh, hello everybody. Like all the other countries in the world, India also tried to utilize this COVID to overcome the crisis, economic crisis. The governments actually, I think that this problem of this healthcare, the entire, we have to see in the entire policy framework, where the total commercialization of the basic healthcare services were going on even earlier. And then the government is utilizing the COVID to promote the health sector reforms. And they, wanted to completely change into an insurance based system and which is actually a reverse subsidy which is going on now and then they introduced the digital health mission also trying to provide privatize the limited public health health care system which was taking care of the 90% of the covid healthcare in india and here in that exploitation the employer-employee relation is becoming uh, totally contractual, casual, and outsourced. And this in India, this new category of the volunteerism that has been promoted. And that is where this ASHA, that means ASHA means hope, and this is accredited social health activists they call, and they are the community health care workers. There in India, means it is already there in that paper. Here, one more feature of that volunteerism in India, which the government, especially this BJP government is promoting is the uh, kind of, not only the gender aspect, but the, uh, and also the traditional role of the care work, which is the unpaid work of the women. But in addition to that, the religious sentiments and the mythical characters are also used in promoting means the, the women has to think that it is their divine duty to do their and their care work. The word Asha itself is hope. Then another category of these caregivers are Mamta. That means affection. Mamta means affection. Then another, then when the, these volunteers were in, introduced in the healthcare system and the institutional deliveries and all have been increased, Instead of appointing the permanent workers, they introduced another category of workers, which is called Yashoda. She, she, she is the foster mother of a popular god, Krishna. 
so these religious things are also introduced into this category of voluntary works and now they are introducing this training to the self so called self help groups so that also a kind of informalization further informalization of the community healthcare work and uh, about the asha workers there are 1 million workforce women all women and earning they are paid less than a dollar a day and when this covid was in uh, covid duty they were assigned to all the other things were covered in that paper the risk then the family pressure and even the community because of this uh, they were uh, called the corona carriers and they were even been attacked by many groups in the localities but then their risk allowance was means uh, uh, around 30 cents a month a, a day for the asha workers the government was saying and when we asked the union we were telling that this is means even less than half of the what the prisoners are getting for their work so they are getting around a 2 dollars per day for their work so this is what is happening and then they were i mean um, they the government is still yet to come out with the how many of these health workers have died out of covid so even there uh, the government has announced an insurance coverage and there also they were asked to produce the even the post mortem report and all means at least 90% of the those who have died has not at uh, got the insurance amount which the government has declared so this is the working condition and other about the other kind of the sanitization workers and other workers even in the health hierarchy one more angle about the caste system also works in india so the uh, especially the um, sanitization workers they uh, uh, the caste angle also work, works in the uh, in their hierarchy and uh, regarding the unionization uh, it's a better unionized and organized sector workers and because of their mere number and even during this period they were having high uh, kind of uh, activism and uh, during this period of one and a half years the asha workers in india had four nation nationwide strikes so and this uh, special covid allowance or what they called for 18 months the government paid that is due to this uh, struggles and also some of the local i means the the state governments also how were forced there were even indefinite strikes by the asha workers in uh, different parts of the country and they could uh, earn uh, some amount of uh, means financial assistance or increase in their remuneration during this period and now excuse me uh, sintu oh yes could you just take one minute now to wrap up yeah yeah, yeah i am wrapping up But okay now, thank you now this is 18 uh, months after 18 months the government is continuing with the covid duty but they have stopped the payment so now they, again we are gearing up for the struggles and uh, means uh, hopefully and this uh, when when we are considering about the struggle of this asha workers the aspect of it is not that their striking power is coming from that community pressure so they are taking care it's, it's a political pressure which is uh, giving them some kind of benefits from the states rather than the kind of pressure due to the strike actions so, so the mere number and the, as women they are building a social pressure also and even during this period we with the entire trade union movement in the country also gear tearing up for their struggle and planning for the next course of our action and uh, means i would like to share and happy news that the government because even as community workers we were a part of the uh, the historic farmer struggle in india as well and today the government was forced to withdraw the draconian agrarian law which they have introduced during this period and uh, hopefully in the coming days we will be able to pressurize the government and only the last point is that in our struggles the public health care free and universalized public health care is one of the major demands which is helping us to earn the public support as well thank you 
Right. And yes, good to have an example of how social movement and mass mobilization can, in fact, push the, the political change. Christina, go ahead, please. Thank you. And this segues perfectly into my comments, which I have to say, I, I am sitting here boiling like a, an internal volcano more than anything else. Now, we have, of course, uh, heard so much about both the historical and the current what I would say violations against mainly women, migrants, uh, and, and as Petro said, of course, also a small minority of men who are working in these sectors. Now, for me, this is a, a failure of solidarity, failure of solidarity between occupations within the industrial relations systems as well. Now, Pedro, I know you are fighting an enormous battle in a country which treats workers extremely badly, at the best of times, but this is in many, many countries, a failure of the industrial relations and the very solidarity which labor unions are built on. Why has it come to this historically? And I, there, I really recommend reading Jennifer's books, which give us that historical perspective. But it's also a failure of solidarity between citizens. In many parts of the world, we clapped for the nurses and the healthcare workers at eight o'clock in the evening, and then we did nothing more. Where are the mass demonstrations, as Jennifer just said, between uh, from the citizens to the governments, who, of course, have failed, failed for generations, have let this rising inequality take place, who have subjected in many countries care to the market, as if that ever was a good idea. But I suppose it's easier to subject care to the market so we can let the rich afford the care at the exploitation of the workers. Nothing has been done to prevent the race to the bottom. And then you look, well, how, how has this happened without any of the mass uh, demonstrations that you have spoken about? But this is also a violation of human rights. If we read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we can see that we are violating those human rights by subjecting workers to these extreme conditions and this extreme exploitation. And then, as you might remember from my introduction, so what about the digital? If I was to peep into the future, is digital going to respond to any of this in any shape or form? A recommendation I, or, or uh, reflections in the report I was lacking? Well, no. If we look at the way digitalization is being, uh, um, what you call, imposed into the healthcare system across the world right now, it is to improve efficiency and productivity. It is not to improve the well-being and the working conditions of the workers. It is not to figure out where were there certain in the COVID times, COVID rules which were not respected, where is there a lack of a PPE, how can we redistribute vaccines, PPE to the world? No, this is about productivity and efficiency. This is about making sure that those who can work, exploited as they are, can work even more. So how do we actually take all of this? How do we take the potentials of digital technology and really look into not only highlighting the gendered, gendered segregation of labor as we have here, but also these conditions and how do we really blow all of these figures up to uh, beyond the, the dedicated uh, experts and workers and unions who are working on this. Because there's one more thing, that even in Denmark, where I live right now, where we have a huge lack of nurses, one thing is not being discussed. And that is right now, or at least these figures are actually two years old, there's an undersupply of healthcare workers of 21 million. What is, is the big question, what will be the consequences of this on all women's labor market participation? Will women, because we are still the ones who do the majority of the care, be pulled out of the labor market? How will this affect not only our economies, but of course, gender struggles throughout decades? When will our governments react to this, not only future, but emergent and very pressing undersupply of healthcare workers? And then lastly, just a reflection here. Can you imagine any, any occupation which was male dominated, which was so important for the current crisis, but for our societies in general, which would receive such little attention? There is not a lack of money in the world but there is a lack of the redistribution of this money to what uh, the report has called for, 
that care is given into public care, which is funded and which is uh, spread to a universal care system. So, I mean, my frustrations, as you might hear in my voice, are many when, when I hear uh, you all speak. And I have to say, this is a failure of action on behalf of our governments, but it is also a failure on behalf of ourselves. Thank you. Very good. This leaves us in an excellent position to, um, uh, to really drill down on what, what it is that we need to do um, to actually build the power. Um, and in fact, I had you know, a question precisely about um, uh, the failure of solidarity on my list. But before I get to that, I just wanted to be able to ask um, two uh, structural questions that will allow us to understand, I think, more specifically what this political economy of healthcare is that we're talking about. And then I'll move on to the couple of questions I have about um, uh, the challenge we have um, for building the alternatives. And in the paper, the, you know, we see that care extractivism depends, um, uh, or as it's presented, uh, the, the report, focuses very much on the hospital as uh, the key work site and a setting for the delivery of care. Uh, but I think as Pedro made clear, when it comes to nurses, nurses' aides, um, and attendants, auxiliary workers, they're very likely to work in non-hospital settings. Um, and that's a pretty broad continuum, old age homes or nursing homes and retirement centers, group houses for persons with disabilities, all kinds of outpatient um, service providers, dialysis centers, and individual homes. Spaces that um, by blurring the boundaries between public and private, enable the state um, to distance itself from responsibility uh, or oversight. And so I'm wondering in terms of the, the picture that um, your team is, is trying to present to us, Lauren, how do we fit this broader array of providers into how you see worker status and leverage within the political economy of healthcare? And then if I could add just another question onto that, if that won't get things too mixed up. Um, uh, there are also references to outsourcing and privatization. Um, and uh, again, I wonder if we can just either name the names or be very specific about um, who pulls those levers of power in privatization. So for example, when we look at fast food workers, or hotel workers, we see that they're working for the same multinational companies, right? They're working for Marriott or McDonald's or Starbucks um, or other um, hotel companies. Also, we now see that temp companies that provide temp workers have gone global. Manpower Inc. is in so many countries. Uh, the Swiss company, Adeco. So when we're talking about nurses and auxiliary sectors, are they also, of these workers, are they also working for global multinational players or who are the agents that are able to control these conditions of privatization and privatized labor without labor standards? So those are two pieces of the political economy picture that um, I hope we can fill in. Thanks, Jennifer. So, I mean, I think you're exactly right that um, the home is an important site of care. Um, in the, so I will speak, let me say that I will speak about the South African example and in reference to community health workers in particular, because that's what I know best. Um, my colleague co-writer Anna is here and I know she knows a lot more about nurses than I do so I'm hoping I can call on her to speak to that dimension of the question. Um, something struck me in uh, Pedro's presentation and it's uh, one of the quotes I think it is from the first worker um, 
it, it was from one of them and it's something that comes up a lot in um, the discourse of South African community health workers, which is they'll say, I love people. The other thing, and it's women mostly, that the women say is, I always wanted to be a doctor. So um, I think the, the one thing to look at is um, that, that it's not an accident um, that we've ended up with a labor force of overexploited and invisibilized women. It's a consequence in South Africa, for example, of decisions in the 1990s to cut, uh, to elim eliminate nursing colleges. This year, in the context of COVID-19, the government has decided to cut uh, government funding uh, for um, nursing programs. Uh, public health care budgets are being cut again, in the context of COVID-19. So I think the home is opened up as a space for providing um, care, underpaid care, uh, precisely because of these bigger policy decisions. Um, I think because people are working in private homes, they're isolated. Um, so again, they can't um, easily organize where community health workers do report to clinics, they often don't have a communal space to meet, or they report to the clinic uh, to clock in or out, so there's limited time to discuss and just be human and to share information at a centralized site of work. Um, so, I mean, I, I would say that um, it's, You know, and then of course, you know, just thinking about the work day, it's in the case of community health workers, it, I think it's slightly different for home-based carers that work in a single household over an extended period of time. In the case of community health workers, there's pressure to service a number of households, let's say between 100 to 200 um, during a set period of time, because I mean, quite frankly, these community health workers um, subsidize a, a public health system that's overstretched. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say by speaking about these examples is that you're right, the home is a site of care, um, that the site of care is opened up because of disinvestment in education programs and in, in public health care, um, that a labor force is available because of this, but also because these are people that care deeply about other people and people living in their communities. So there is a kind of predatory relationship um, to the emotional dimension. Um, and, and I think the, the other thing in the context of South Africa, and it might be a little different in other countries, but um, the other kind of component of this is in, in the context of high unemployment and a state that refuses to institutionalize a social welfare system that gives citizens access to a basic income, right? That would decommodify many of the things that they need to survive. Uh, this kind of exploitative work is framed as access to at least some kind of wage. Um, and, and then it's kind of framed as having the dignity both of love, uh, of voluntarism, but also of work. Uh, but of course, it's not decent work. And um, Christina or Pedro, you want to comment on um, uh, this whole sort of uh, both corporate and charitable continuum uh, that seems to um, uh, structure and exert control over this labor market? And, um, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about privatization and outsourcing the changes and the influences this structure? So here in Connecticut, to go back to uh, Francine Bailey, the nursing home worker, in Connecticut, nursing homes are mostly for-profit enterprises, believe it or not, and these owners are very uh, wealthy. Uh, we, uh, when we used to do negotiations in person, they drive in on their Teslas, on their Porsche, right? And obviously, all of those profits are coming from the women, do, women doing the job on the front lines. Uh, in the case of... Um, Jennifer Brown, who is on strike at Sunrise, Sunrise is supposed to be a nonprofit agency, but it's the same for her. She's, she has to pay $6,000 a month for family health insurance, and she doesn't even make half of that. 
because her wages are under $18 an hour. And the CEO is making over $300,000 a year down in Florida. This is a Florida company. So for us, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, the effect is the same on the worker. Poverty wages, scant access to health care unless the union has fought for it, and forget about retirement. Uh, you can leave your nursing home, your last day on the job. We've seen this during COVID as the other workers were not willing to take the risk. Uh, after 40 years on the job, uh, they have nothing to show for it. And in the case of the home care workers, uh, that's a quasi public job here in Connecticut for the independent home care workers covered by uh, by the union contracts that's 10,000 workers making 16.25 an hour. Um, that's a quasi state job, they are actually in the worst position because they have no job security, no health insurance, no pay time off. Uh, but uh, to get back to where is the power, I think the union really understands that the only way we win is if we fight. If we don't fight, if we don't have solidarity, if we don't have union, nothing is going to happen, right? The profits are always going to win at the end of the day, because that's sort of the natural tendency of our leaders when, when unions are weak and when solidarity is weak. Uh, so, you know, and, and I, I do appreciate what Lauren said. Here is the conundrum, right? Even for our members who have the right to strike, it is very difficult for them to say, okay, today I'm not going to the job. And you know what, Tracy and Susan and Johnny who need me every day, the hell with them. I don't care. I want my paycheck. These workers don't think like that. These workers want to make sure that the people they care for every day are going to be taken care of, that they will be able to come back and see them healthy. Uh, and of course, they've reached an understanding that there's no way they can provide quality care if they can provide for their own families and for themselves. Right? So through COVID, this just became so evident that we're not going back there. These workers are not going back there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it, you know, without the solidarity, these workers would still be pulling off uh, multiple overtime shifts, you know, short staffing all over the place, and the $400 million in additional funding would certainly not be there. When the governor first sent out his budget draft, that money wasn't in the budget. It was when the workers said, okay, then we're going on strike when, when the money was added on. And I'll add, you know, um, again, even with hospitals, uh, because they're operating this um, for-profit market driven healthcare system in the United States and, and elsewhere, it doesn't matter whether they're nonprofit charitable hospitals or for-profit hospitals, they act according to the same aggressive, um, you know, very extortionate policies. Yale New Haven Hospital does this. It's allegedly a charitable um, teaching hospital. And yet, it turns out they had um, really aggressive debt collection policies, including placing liens on over a thousand people's homes um, just in the city of, of New Haven. So, um, so yes, we have to target, you know, the fact that this is, you know, uh, the for-profit imperatives. Um, and with COVID, uh, you would think, okay, this is now laid bare, the dysfunctionality of that system, and yet the ideological commitment to it is is so deep. So, Christina, I know you had a comment, and then I'll just ask, um, uh, you know, two brief questions about organizing, so that I can then open it up to the general questions. But, Christina, please go ahead. Yeah, just a very quick comment on procurement. So, all expectations are, of course, that public procurement is just going to rise sharply after, not after, but during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and, and beyond. And it's doing so. And it's fascinating to see the majority of governments, how they talk about procurement is it is to increase productivity and efficiency. This has become a narrative which has become sort of like a mantra. But even the OECD, in their, they have a graph from last year that shows that labor productivity has declined over the last decade, at the same time as the exponential introduction of, of new technologies and privatization. So, uh, as, and, uh, you know, as Pedro was saying, it's the redistribution of money that is the core problem here. Yet our government somehow have fallen for this narrative of productivity and efficiency. And I think very much in light of, let's get it out of the workplaces, into the homes, away from the public hands, because then we don't need to take responsibility. 
And, you know, seriously, I've just stepped out of the board of the Global Partnership on AI and Intergovernmental Cooperation, where governments from around the world were hailing human rights, yet very few of them are upholding them. And everything that has been, all the abuses here are an abuse of those human rights. I really think we should gather around the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and remind our governments what they have signed. What is happening here is an exploitation and, and, and a violation of those rights. And procurement is no, no response. Uh, not to mention, go back to uh, those governments who did not sign this in the 1940s. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, yes, actually, you have touched on something that I think is really um, also necessary. Uh, in the report, the paper that um, we read that uh, Lauren presented, um, uh, there's a welcome and heavy emphasis on reinvestment in public institutions, public services, and the social budget um, that neoliberal policies have relentlessly instead pushed austerity and privatization. But I think there is an even uh, deeper foundational problem and challenge that will have to be overcome as well, which is uh, the very ideological discrediting and undermining of any notion of public goods as legitimate. Um, uh, the ideological discrediting of the socialization of risk. I mean, this is what neoliberalism encompasses, the idea that no, 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 uh, markets will work. We will have you know, uh, self-correcting markets and therefore each individual will just bear risk on his or her own. Uh, you're responsible for your own risk and therefore your own security. And so it seems to me there's an ideological project that um, will have to accompany this, that will restore commitment to the socialization of risk. And how do we do this now with the component of gender and racial justice at the core of it. Um, and with that in mind, I just will quickly ask you, first of all, because we have to get to the general questions, but if gender is so crucial to the creation and perpetuation of these hierarchies um, in the political economy of healthcare and to the modes of, of worker exploitation and disempowerment, what are the gendered strategies, ideological, tactical, institutional for building power? And then the second question or the corollary to that is the one about solidarity because historically nurses did not want to organize with the auxiliary workers. They, they wanted to just bring them under control of the nursing hierarchy, um, but they perceived that whole uh, continuum of auxiliary workers as undercutting their skilled labor. And so in addition to the uh, questions of caste and race and citizenship status, what are the frameworks and rhetorics and new possibilities for cross-class and cross-occupational solidarity? So, so you've asked a question that makes me feel very despondent. <laughs> um, no, you guys are here for the solutions. <laughs> so, so I think uh, in general um, that we need as, as a kind of baseline response um, child care services that are free and of good quality. Um, I think to the extent that uh, there are patriarchal norms that assume that women will take primary responsibility for childcare. Women across all occupational classes, employed and unemployed, uh, take on the brunt of this work. Um, it is intense, uh, it is stressful, and it also involves uh, things, for example, like making sure that there's access to food. So it's not just about care in the abstract, it's actually about securing the infrastructure, water, education, food, and so forth. Um, that ensures the well-being of dependents in the household, typically children, but also older adults. And so I think to the extent <clears throat> that 
these services are not socialized, the responsibility falls disproportionately to women. Um, that said, uh, in the context of austerity policies, which certainly in the South we're facing once again, um, I am not sure how, how to secure even that basic service without a kind of mass push by workers across all occupations for this kind of service. I think, um, you know, even if we go beyond childcare, I think one of the things that COVID has exposed is that everyone works all the time, uh, but we're not necessarily paid for it. And the work we do is important. It's, it's work of sustaining life. Uh, and so I think the, the other kind of big policy ask, which would, I think, benefit women more than men because they're disproportionately responsible for social reproduction work, is uh, universal basic income for everyone, citizens, non-citizens, men and women. Um, I can see. <laughs> I can see Christina shaking. Well, you know what, can I also ask Sindhu to um, uh, respond in terms of what she sees as the gendered strategies for um, uh, for building power and also the possibilities of um, solidarity across occupation? The policy attack itself is uh, giving the ground for a larger solidarity and unified actions that is our experience even in india the entire I mean, the uh, social uh, barriers that also because of this uh, this is the this uh, asha workers experience means that there are some kind of government related jobs so that is the only income now in the household so even during the festival season, the women coming out on the streets for the struggles. So the family is supporting, or the community is supporting. So the entire policy attack and the, um, that situation created of the hunger and uh, joblessness, and that is also creating such an atmosphere. And with the trade union movement and the larger mass movements, uh, taking up such mass scale campaigns and actions. So that is helpful. The, the recent developments in India is showing that. So even the caste barriers and the communal polarization also has been means, diminished during these struggles, these mass movements. So that is the hope and we are continuous and consistent efforts that will be the only uh, solution to make this kind of a change and this is a, that atmosphere is being created because people have been pushed to the wall so there is no going back now the people are realizing that also all these now today is one of also the first strike against the neoliberal policies in india it was 29th of november 20 uh, sorry 1991 so that policy that now it has resulted in such kind of a mass actions. So that will be the future, hopefully. And um, uh, Christina and Pedro, I know you want to jump in here, but just quickly, Brianna and um, uh, Deepika, it looks like we we responded to um, with that question some of the uh, questions that are in the Q and A. But is there? Another question that's in the Q and A that um, uh, can quickly be addressed since we're uh, approaching the end of the session. Yeah. So, uh, Patrulika Chatterjee has a question. Um, Patrulika is a journalist and also part of GHJP. Uh, she asked, uh, she mentioned that ASHAs are the mainstay of the Indian health system, but they're not a part of uh, the formal workforce in India. They've been agitated, agitating to be formalized. Is this also the case in South Africa and in other countries? Yeah, for sure. This has been one of the key demands and also to be recognized not only as formal employees, but as public sector employees with the uh, collective bargaining rights that comes with that. Uh, there's and another question by Nandini, which uh, I don't think has been answered, which is uh, to Lauren, uh, where she says that uh, she, uh, 
Lauren did go through the policy recommendations really quickly, but uh, the recommendations that were presented were drafted in gender neutral terms, whereas it is clear that globally care workers are predominantly women. Could the recommendations be framed in terms that bring women to the center stage of the discussion? And there's another question by Greg, uh, which is uh, for everybody. And there's another comment by Kajal, which is uh, just a comment. Sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to read the, the questions as you yes, asking yes. them. So, so uh, I think yes and no, that the recommendations, I think, seem to be framed in, in gender neutral terms. However, I think because they deal with a sector that predominantly employs women, the assumption underpinning our analysis was that they disproportionate, disproportionately benefit women. Um, that said, uh, I don't think the paper necessarily speaks to how you shift assumptions about uh, social reproduction work being in the responsibility of women. Um, there's some reference to um, uh, public provision of uh, things like childcare, for example. I think that's one way in which you take um, that kind of work out of the household and into the public sphere and you socialize it. But I think a more complicated question is about how you shift uh, or de-gender care work um, and how you make men responsible for this kind of work. Um, you know, there are policies around this in the North that's, that are organized, for example, around maternity leave. The challenge in um, southern states where much employment is precarious um, or where that kind of work is uh, where work is often informal is that those kinds of state-sponsored uh, gender equity policies don't necessarily reach the majority of the population um, i mean i i think also um yeah let me leave it there and um, Pedro, did you see um, the, the question uh, that um, uh, Greg asked about how we also talk about racial as well as gender um, solidarity and overcome um, overcome the things that have uh, distanced workers and distanced workers and um, uh, uh, the patients with whom they're working? and their potential allies. Yeah, I think part of the shift, if we're gonna get there uh, as to achieving justice for these workers and sort of degenderizing if possible, has to be banging on that message, right? Every communication we put out, every story we put out, we talk about how these jobs rely on the work of women, mostly black and brown and immigrant women, and they're making poverty wages with scan to any benefits. So we put that in every, every communication we have out there and it, and it works because now you have journalists assuming those talking points. So in other words, they will state it as a matter of fact in their writing that this is a, a, a labor force that is majority women and majority black, Latina and immigrant women. And then they will put a quote of one of the people we are featuring, right? So the journalists have internalized the, the message, which is an accurate message and it's a true message. And we know historically it has uh, a genealogy, right? That we can track uh, back to. Um, one thing the union is, is doing, and I think it's part of that failure of solidarity that Christina spoke about is uh, bringing in more, more women into leadership positions at the union, right? Uh, honestly, if you look backwards, it's mostly men and it's mostly white men, even in a progressive union like 1199. That is shifting now, right? Now we have a home care vice president who is female. Now we have a group home and day program vice president who is a Jamaican woman, uh, right? Uh, our president is of Haitian descent, Rob Burrell. Uh, so uh, making sure we, we bank the message of who is doing the work and, and their, 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 their race, uh, right, and their, and their immigration, uh, uh, but also bringing in more rank and file women and bringing in more, more women leadership uh, into the union, uh, I think goes a long way. And as you saw in the Hartford Current, um, OPED by Francine, who lost her mother, 
Uh, one of the ways we were able to persuade the Hartford Current to run that on Sunday is we asked them, how many times do you have a black woman writing an op-ed in your Sunday paper? And you can take a look at the last 365 days. Again, it's mostly white men in those op-ed pages. So we sort of told the Current, you know, this is your opportunity to feature a black woman who's actually on the front lines. And not only that, but she has an amazing story to tell. But that was a negotiation with the Hartford Current. Okay, and then Christina, I'll just um, give you a last um, uh, chance to comment because we're at the end of our time. But I, I'll say quickly when when you mentioned we're not going back and how the workers, you know, one of the phrases, of course, of 1199 workers, but also really SEIU care workers around the country has been, uh, we're not invisible anymore. You know, we're no longer invisible. You know, to really make both themselves and their labor visible and show how it's absolutely central to the functioning of the economy and the polity. But the other part I think of not going back is we can't simply go back to the labor laws and social um, welfare uh, policies of the 30s in the terms of the 30s, because those were structured, in fact, to exclude in the US African-American workers. Um, they were structured to exclude agricultural workers, uh, workers in female dominated sectors. And so in thinking forward, it can't be simply let's go back to the thirties. It definitely has to be reimagining what new fair labor standards legislation would look like. But Christina, I know you have a lot to add, so please um, tie it together for us. <laughs> Go on. No, I mean, yeah, Kick just it a few out of the park. Yeah, <laughs> just, no, just a few comments. Also to a couple of comments in the, in the Q&A there. But you also, you asked, would digitalization of the healthcare system help to alleviate any of this? And I would really, really, really caution about this tech solutionism. A lot of people are sort of saying, well, let's bring technology into it because that will help the productivity and efficiency and so on. When I have said that, when I've warned against that, and this is something that I really hope can be applied across the world. I think unions and social movements need to enter into the journey of data storytelling. We need to be able to prove what are the conditions of healthcare workers prove in text, in numbers, in data storytelling, and to break the narrative of truth that somehow has become so dominant, but which is industry led. So I really, if I was to end on a constructive note, I would look into that. I think just digitalizing the healthcare sector won't work. But union tech or really applying good technology to the workers in this to have beyond doubt, this is not just touching anecdotal stories, but this is quantifiable information, I think would be very strong. Another thing we need to commit our governments to is taxation. They need to talk about, talk about the redistribution of tax on a global level again, as we were talking about. And my last comment has to do with something, Jennifer, that you said, and that's around the individualization of risk. Don't forget that that individualization is getting worse and worse with when now that we're entering into datafied societies. As much data they have on the individuals, insurances, healthcare, everything will be individualized. Gone is the collective risk. So it's on all levels that if this individualization and fragmentation is going on. Why I can only end my little spiel here by saying, we have to remember the solidarity, the solidarity between occupations, between classes, between nations, between regions of the world. And if there's ever been a time for global movement, it's now. And as I, I always tell my students in teaching history, the one thing you really learn from the past is nothing is inevitable. I mean, really the ideological line of the financial elites, the conservatives, the uh, you know um, the austerity people is oh, budget cutting austerity is inevitable. It's inexorable. It is a necessity. Well, nothing is inevitable. The only things that happen are the things that we built and we create, the ideas we generate, and the social alliances. So thank you all 
all of you for your participation, um, for really generating uh, such uh, an exciting conversation. I hope that everybody who has um, uh, been a participant in the audience will continue to get in touch with um, uh, these authors, these activists, these thinkers, and I don't know if um, either Ali or Uni want to make a final comment about uh, follow up to this um, to this crucial work. Oh. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining this discussion. I think it's uh, from the comments that have been made and the questions that have been posed. I mean, this is an absolutely uh, critical area that we need to pay attention to and not just us but policymakers. so how do we insert these um, uh, these discussions into the domain of policy uh, so uh, not to take too much time what we will try and do is to disseminate this as widely as possible and see how we can have such discussions again in the future but bringing in uh, policymakers uh, who are currently involved in making policy as well. Uh, so uh, we will be uh, uh, disseminating the recording of this webinar, uh, but we might also take some sound bites and then um, then hope uh, that it'll it'll reach a wider audience uh, in the coming weeks and months. So thank you once again, and um, yeah, it's.